Hello, and welcome to another virtual gathering of the Pritzker Forum on Global Cities. In this series, we bring together influential voices for a dialogue on the role that cities play in addressing global challenges. Cities and civic leaders are at the forefront of combating a wide range of issues, including the global pandemic, managing the increasing flow of migration, and addressing threats to democratic governance. And in times of war, cities become battlegrounds. We're seeing this play out in Ukraine, where cities have become the forefront and front lines of the 100 plus days war with Russia. Once thriving metropolises such as Kyiv, Kharkiv, and Mariupol have become active war zones, where people have been subject to horror, destruction, and unimaginable suffering. In cities across Ukraine, the destruction has not just been limited to human life and property, but the vibrant urban life of cities, their culture and heritage, and the very way of life for millions of Ukrainians have also been imperiled. As the most visible manifestations of democratic life in society, cities represent the antithesis of the order that authoritarian leaders seek to impose. And today, we're going to examine how cities are key actors in responding to the Russian invasion, both on the battlegrounds in Ukraine and in providing humanitarian aid and welcoming refugees. We're going to begin today's program with a panel from the literal front lines, where mayors have become visible leaders in this conflict, continuing to provide services to residents under unimaginable circumstances. The mayor of Kharkiv, along with the deputy minister of Ukraine's Ministry of Digital Transformation, are going to discuss how local leaders have partnered with national counterparts to advance their efforts. And we'll hear from the U.S.-Ukraine Foundation on how international networks have mobilized to support the people of Ukraine. Our next panel will look at the human toll as over 14 million people have fled their homes, including by seeking safety across borders. And we'll learn how international leaders from the United Nations and Caritas internationalists are supporting and working with local communities outside as well as within Ukraine to provide short-term relief and long-term support for refugees. This program and our year-round work in global cities are made possible by generous support from our partners, including the Pritzker family and the Pritzker Family Foundation, our lead sponsor, Underwriters Laboratories, our supporting sponsor, Kirkland and Ellis, and by the Robert R. McCormick Foundation. Thanks to them and to each of you for taking the time to join us today. We invite you to engage with us on Twitter throughout the program at underscore global cities to take part in the conversation. The Pritzker Forum is a partnership of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and the Financial Times. We've been so pleased to host together since 2015. It's now my pleasure to welcome Peter Spiegel, who is the U.S. Managing Editor of the Financial Times. Thanks, Brian. When the Chicago Council approached the Financial Times about launching the Pritzker Forum on Global Cities seven years ago, I assumed that the issues we'd be tackling would be pretty straightforward. Making cities more livable, putting urban issues like public transportation and infrastructure on the global agenda, and highlighting international policy disputes over things like free trade, immigration, multiculturalism, where the views of cities differed substantially from the rest of our voting populations. Needless to say, those issues, while still very important, have been forced to take a back seat here at the Pritzker Forum in recent years for far more urgent crises. A pandemic that called into question the very survival of our cities, which are reliant for their vitality on the exact things that were helping spread the disease. Population density, physical commingling, critical mass. Then protests erupted in cities both here in the U.S. and across the world, calling into question whether urban police forces and judicial systems really believed that black lives matter. And to round it off, economic turmoil and rising crime rates have put already vulnerable communities in our cities into even more precarious positions. But none of this, none of this could prepare any of us for what has happened in some of the world's most storied cities over the last three months. Kiev which has blossomed from a tired Soviet-era regional capital into an exciting, vibrant European metropolis filled with young hipsters, cutting-edge startups and fabulous groceries, was shelled like something out of a World War II-era newsreel. Its suburbs literally raped and pillaged. 
Kharkiv and Mariupol have been added to a list of place names like Ypres and Stalingrad, Sarajevo and Aleppo, whose only common trait is that they were destroyed by war. And millions of families, many bearing young children, piled into Lviv and Krakow, overwhelming municipal services despite the best intentions of local citizens. But just as the pandemic introduced us to local heroes who put their own lives at risk to treat the dying and manage the role of massive vaccine programs, and just as George Floyd's killing forced us to find police chiefs and mayors who have been effective in revamping and reforming out-of-date law enforcement practices, the war in Ukraine has produced municipal and regional officials who, steeled by the forge of conflict, have emerged as leaders for their nation and the world. Many of them are here at our conference today. This should remind us that history is replete with local regional officials who have rallied their nations and even the international community during periods of war and conflict. Willy Brandt, who was then mayor of West Berlin, became the global symbol of the free world's resistance to Soviet militarism in Central and Eastern Europe during the 50s and 60s. I know it may be hard to remember, but there was a time when Rudy Giuliani rallied the American people and the broader family of civilized nations as New York's mayor in the aftermath of September 11th. And my personal favorite, having raised my children in Belgium, is Adolf Max, the liberal mayor of Brussels when the German army captured the city in the First World War and gained international fame for standing up to the occupying forces. He died a Belgian hero, having served as mayor until his death on the eve of the Second World War. To that list, we can now add Vitaly Klitschko, the one-time heavyweight champion, who as mayor of Kiev was a constant presence on the front lines during the Russian bombardment, confronting survivors, rousing first responders, bearing witness to genocide. It is a grim business, and one that no mayor or regional leader would ever wish for his legacy. But let us also remember that many of those same cities that suffered catastrophic, catastrophic destruction in war can reemerge as great centers of commerce, culture, and learning if our leaders get the rebuilding right. London after the Blitz, Berlin after the end of the Cold War, Dubrovnik after the siege. Just last month, I met Claudia Lopez, the recently elected mayor of Bogota. For decades, Colombia had been synonymous with warring drug cocktails and violent Marxist insurgents. But Lopez, the first woman and the first member of the LGBT community to become mayor of Bogota, has transformed the country's capital through investments in bigger, greener public transportation systems and a public health system aimed at helping vulnerable women who traditionally have shouldered much of the burden in caring for their children, their siblings, and their parents. Under the right leadership, then, our troubled, besieged cities in Ukraine and in other turbulent parts of the globe can reemerge, scarred by memories of some unspeakable violence, to be sure, but also emboldened by their struggle to rebuild and return to the vibrant, hopeful futures they once were able to dream about. Let us hope that the Ukrainian leaders who have joined us here today will be able to start on that path sooner rather than later. Back to you, Brian. Thanks, Peter. It's always such a pleasure to work with the Financial Times to host these important events. Now, diving right into the program, our first panel today explores how cities and local communities are leading the response to the war in Ukraine and their vision for recovery and rebuilding. Our panel, which is moderated by Ed Luce of the Financial Times, features Valeria Ionin, who is the Deputy Minister for Euro Integration at Ukraine's Ministry for Digital Transformation. Also, Nadia McConnell, who is the President and Co-Founder of the U.S. Ukraine Foundation, and Mayor Igor Terehov of Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. And now over to you, Ed. Thank you very much, Brian. It's um, a great pleasure as always to be with the Chicago Council and particularly with the Pritzker Forum on Global Cities. Um, uh, so let's get straight to it. This is a, a, a short panel, but a very important topic with really, really interesting panelists. Um, one of the things of the many things that have surprised the world and perhaps some Ukrainians about the country's response to Russia's invasion since February 24th is the resilience of the re Ukrainian response. It's, it's, it's not just um, that they've pushed back Russian forces, it's the manner in which local resistance has occurred. And I think two of the most surprising and interesting aspects of this, one is the use of technology, um, the use of simple cell phones 
um, to communicate with different Ukrainian groups and localities about Russian positions. Um, and secondly, it's the morale at the local level of citizens, of Ukrainian citizens and military. And of course, in many cases, people are both. Um, and the sort of flat hierarchical structure, which I think goes um, with this di digital sophistication. Um, so, so with me um, to discuss Ukraine's response, the, 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 the frontline Ukrainian response to this invasion, uh, and also how it's going to rebuild after, um, after this war is over, this tragic war is over, is a, is a really brilliant panel. We've got Igor Terakov, who's the mayor of Kharkiv, uh, Ukraine's second largest city, a city that until recently was semi-encircled, but has managed to push back Russian forces, but of course has sustained huge damage. Um, we also have Valeria Ionen, who is Ukraine's vice minister for um, Euro integration and digital transformation, which is an interesting combination of titles that we'll get to. And last but not least, Nadia McConnell, who's um, co-founder and president of the US Ukraine Foundation, which is playing um, an important role in helping Ukrainians at the local level throughout this war. Um, uh, Valeria, let me start with you. Um, uh, because uh, the role of technology um, in this has been quite extraordinary. You, you're um, operating under the um, motto, for want of a better word, uh, that modern war requires modern solutions. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about what you've been doing to facilitate um, the resistance of communities at the local level with your digital ecosystem? What kind of a role has it played in Ukraine's response? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, I would like to explain a little bit of context before. So before the war, the presidential program state in a smartphone had the highest level of support of Ukrainians among other governmental initiatives. And this program was and is fully implemented by the Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, which is a totally new ministry in Ukraine. We are only two and a half years old. And when we started our um, uh, activity, we had four main strategic goals, which were mainly about a basic digital infrastructure. So we planned to make 100% of public services um, online to cover all the country with an access to the internet, to teach Ukrainians with digital literacy and to develop the IT industry by increasing the level of IT in GDP of Ukraine up to 10%. And to achieve all of these goals, we created the ecosystem of digital projects, which is called DIA, and which actually has five different directions. The first one is the mobile application DIA, which is used Used by more than 17 millions of Ukrainian people and which is about documents in smartphone and the most popular services in smartphone. Then the uh, state portal for public services, DIA City, which is the uh, first virtual business country. Uh, this is a special project on um, special economic and tax conditions for IT companies. DIA Digital Education, a big program on the development of digital literacy, and DIA Business, national projects on the development of SMEs. And we had some really good results and achievements in all of these directions right before the war. But then on the 24th of February, the war started and we had to adjust our work very fast and we had to take some time um, to think about new, uh, new goals and actually um, new activities and new services that should be created in response to the war. So we quickly continued to develop new services in our application DIA, for example, assistance to the army, the opportunity to transfer funds uh, to the army, then a special e-support program. It is a special financial assistance to the people from settlements where war actions are taking place. Then a special, uh, we, we have created a special chatbot with authorization through DIA app to provide our armed forces with the information about Russian troops or Russian technique. 
um, we launched DIA TV and uh, DIA radio in the application to provide Ukrainians with uh, truthful news during 24 hours per seven days a week. And um, we also have created lots of other services. For example, we initiated the creation of volunteer movement, the IT Army of Ukraine. Uh, this IT army already has more than 3,100 cyber specialists, so the tasks are aimed at destabilizing the work of Russian and Belarusian key internet portals, government and banking sites, social networks of Russian politicians and media, as well as running media campaign. Um, talking about the coordination with local communities and authorities, uh, the Ministry of Digital Transformation has introduced a new position a year ago. This new position is called CDTO, which means Chief Digital Transformation Officer. And um, this Chief Digital Transformation Officer now um, works as the position in the ministries and in digital agencies and also at the regional level. So the main responsibilities of CDTO are the development of basic digital infrastructure, like the connection, um, administrative service centers, uh, centers for public services, I'm sorry, paperless regime and others. Then introduction of um, um, other public services, implementation of digital industry projects in medicine, education, infrastructure, environment, culture, and others, uh, increasing the level of digital literacy among the population, and simplification of management with the help of dashboards, digitalization of registers, introduction of e-document management, and others. Um, so, Thanks to the network of CDTO, we, during the war, and thanks to our DIA mobile application, we could uh, easily implement any new service in any region of Ukraine. That's, that's very interesting, and, and we'll sort of get, get a little bit more into that um, later. Um, but, uh, Mayor Terekhov, um, uh, you know, Kharkiv, I, I know that you, you became mayor of Kharkiv, um, only last October, which of course is interesting timing. Um, uh, and um, you've had a very, very challenging start to your job. For people outside of Ukraine, uh, looking, looking on at, at these extraordinary events since February, um, one of the questions that um, really comes to the front of mind is how you manage to operate under conditions of being shelled, of artillery bombardment, of of uh, having this attack on your city whilst trying to run it. Could you talk a little bit about what sort of resources you've drawn upon, uh, what kind of improvisations you've had to make in order to keep your city functioning under these conditions? Yes, indeed. And my greetings to you. The city of Kharkiv was very heavily bombarded, both from land and from air. It started at 5 in the morning on February 24th, the day when the Russian aggressor invaded Ukraine at large. Of course, our situation was quite challenging at the beginning. People were disoriented, did not know what to do. It was hard for them to realize that a full-scale war had started, so those very first few hours were the hardest. But soon after, I called a meeting of all our utility companies and services, and they continued to work despite massive shelling and airstrikes. It was important for us to maintain the system of utility services we have in Kharkiv. That means, first and foremost, the supply of running water, and our supply line comes from reservoirs that are uh, 140 kilometers away, so that was a big challenge. Plus, it was still winter, so the city needed heating, the cold was reaching 20 degrees below zero in Celsius on some days, and the Russian aggressor was aiming to hit our electric transformer substations, water pumping plants, 
to leave our city without heating and running water. So our technicians had to work under enemy fire in body armor and helmets to lay down new pipelines. We uh, laid alternative pipelines on the ground instead of underground in those war zone conditions. I would like to point out that all our personnel of utility services had been working as one team despite the most brutal fire strikes against Kharkiv. And today the danger still remains because although we have pushed back the Russian aggressor from the city, it is still uh, within reach of their long-range artillery. Another issue of major importance was solid waste disposal. The city was doing this every day, that's very important, because if you fail to collect garbage for a week, this will cause epidemics. And I was aware of that, so we continued to collect and remove garbage all over the city. Every city service has done a good job. This was not easy, but everybody was focused on achieving the result that we have, and that is stability in delivering municipal services to city residents. That is our most important accomplishment, and we continue to work for that goal, so, uh, so that our city continues to live and continues to work and remains livable for its people despite the war. Thank you. Well, that's uh, 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 given the minus 20 degrees, pretty extraordinary um, to be able to continue under those conditions. Um, and again, I'd like to get back, drill down a little deeper um, later on. Um, Nadia McConnell, you, you, uh, you founded the uh, US Ukraine um, Foundation and, and you've been working at the local level um, in Ukraine, trying to build up local capacity for, for a lot longer than this war, for many, many, many years. Um, uh, and I know that, you know, since this war began, uh, one of the things that struck me and many other observers is the degree of local um, response to the Ukrainian situation. People do feel it. I think of soccer crowds in Europe, but uh, it's felt way beyond just Ukrainian diasporas, which of course are, uh, are spread across America, particularly in Chicago. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how you've tapped and channeled these networks um, uh, in order to help um, Ukraine during this situation and what kind of help are you able to provide? Well, uh, thank you, Ed. First, I want to thank the Prisker Forum for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, something that is very near and dear to my heart, and that's working at the local level. Uh, I believe that the economy of, an, of a country is built at the local level, at the, at the state level, and also that a strategic partnership between our country and Ukraine needs to go deeper than just at the bilateral. Uh, going down to the grassroots. Actually, in 1997, we embarked on a major local government project. Um, for over 10 years, we trained over 40,000 local government officials. We had training centers in Kharkiv, uh, Donetsk, Kherson, Cherkasy, and Viu. And we, un we saw the unleashing of really the, uh, not only the resilience, but the ingenuity and innovation of people at the local level. Uh, we partnered um, 18 Ukrainian cities with medium-sized cities with uh, medium-sized cities in the United States, uh, working on economic development. And I think what was unique about that, which also I, I would see uh, really something that should happen in the future in the rebuilding, is that we engage the whole community in these partnerships. Uh, from the government, uh, the mayors. Uh, one of the things we found is the best relationships were really peer to peer. So mayors uh, working with mayors, uh, the water department officials working with their counterparts, but also we engaged the, uh, the chambers of commerce, uh, the whole community uh, as a whole working together. So uh, I am not at all surprised, I guess, by the what you're seeing the outpouring not only of resilience but of course uh the response uh we, you know when the war started in 14 uh 
there, there was no Ukrainian military to speak of, right? It was volunteers. Uh, when the internally dis displaced people came, uh, the Ukrainian government didn't have the capacity or infrastructure. They never had to deal with it. So citizens of local com communities in Ukraine welcomed uh, displaced people from other cities. So we're seeing an extension of that. Um, and so I think it's very, uh, I, I think this is really uh, a phenomenon that I understand is not necessarily seen in other parts of the, of the world of these kind of crises. So now with the humanitarian crisis, we see all these communities, not only uh, diaspora communities, but faith-based communities, but also uh, cities, communities in the United States across the country that have been engaged, whether it's with our program or other programs like Open World, responding um, like the whole world is responding. And I think they could be a major key uh, in the rebuilding process as well. And I just want to say to the mayor, uh, Kharkiv has always been uh, one of our priorities in our programs over the past 30 years. Uh, when the war started in 14, we worked with the, uh, the city uh, we sent uh, several shipments uh, of supplies to your hospitals. Uh, we also, at, at one point, uh, worked briefly on a representative office from Kharkiv. So um, we, whatever it is that we can do in this current situation, we are prepared uh, to be of help. Thank you for that. Um, and, I, and I will just go back to, to, to Meterov um, to, to ask him about the same question, but the other way around. Um, before I get to you, Valeria. Um, and, and that is, Ukraine has also been remarkably successful at fighting the information war. This isn't just a kinetic war, it's an information war for international opinion. Um, and I know that you, as mayor of Kharkiv, and, and your counterparts across Ukraine, of course, including President Zelensky, um, have been reaching out to um, uh, leaders, city, your city counterparts, sister cities, um, and uh, trying to gin up um, support for, for example, um, a, a, an embargo on Russian energy um, and other initiatives to help you win this war. Talk, talk, talk to us a little bit about what your social media strategy has been and what your broader information strategy has been in making Ukraine's case to other parts of the West in particular and what the West's response has been. Well, this indeed is a very important question. For us, the people of Ukraine, it is extremely important to have international political support. And a special role in this is played by communities in the United States. Since the beginning of this invasion, I have talked with my counterparts, I could say colleagues in other cities, and in the United States, I talked with the mayors of New York City, Chicago, and Boston. We have a sister city relationship with Cincinnati, Ohio, and I have hope, and there is some preparation in progress for us to establish a partnership, a sister city relationship with Boston. That would be extremely important for us it would give our community a strong and inspiring message of support from the American people. So in every telephone call and in every written message, including the social media that you mentioned, I have tried to appeal to leaders of local communities and to civil diplomacy leaders to rally for getting us the help we need. And here is what I mean. Some time ago, we expected that we would get help protecting the sky over Ukraine. Our President Volodymyr Zelensky was making those appeals a number of times. And besides that, we are dealing with a hybrid war of 
colossal scale. It would be wrong to say that this war is only fought in the front line. It is fought in many areas, including the information war. And it is extremely important for us to win the information war as well. We need to tell the world the truth about the war crimes and atrocities committed by the Russian aggressors, their acts of genocide against the Ukrainian people. There have been allegations from the opposite side that no such crimes really happened and that Ukraine simply imitated and staged those scenes. But I can tell you with full responsibility, from the very first hours of this invasion, when the Russian army was ordering their soldiers to kill our peaceful civilians, all that still continues. Our residential areas continue to be bombarded and shelled all the time. So what we are dealing with is Russia's war against Ukraine as a nation. They are trying to destroy and erase us. I said this before, and I repeat responsibly. What they are doing is genocide against the people of Ukraine, against our nation. So the most important thing now is for people to know the truth. And mayors, as well as other public leaders, can help their people understand this truth. It is a full-scale war, and not some special operation as the invaders falsely allege. This war is taking place over, over the whole territory of Ukraine and our city is an outpost in that war. In this war, my country and my city are defending the institutions of democracy and we serve as a defense barrier for the rest of Europe and in fact for the whole world against this plague that is trying to spread all across the world. So we certainly would like to count on political support and other kinds of support that includes financial and also the support with weapons from the United States, the United Kingdom and other nations that are not indifferent and understand what is going on and are providing that assistance for us. Thank you. Sorry, as a, as a journalist, I can't resist straying a little bit off topic with a very quick follow up question to the mayor, um, which is clearly some of the shelling has abated. Some of the attacks on Kharkiv have, have abated. Do you expect that to remain the case? I can tell you that the intensity of bombardments is down, but nevertheless, the Russian Federation still has the capability to make artillery strikes at Kharkiv as well as other places of Ukraine and besides missile strikes take place from various directions and airstrikes cannot be disregarded either. So those are the dangers and threats that we have. Thank you. Uh, Valeria, uh, let's look forward because all smart policy is about looking around the corner. You, you have lost I don't know how many um, people to to um, as refugees to other countries, particularly to Poland, but to neighboring countries. Millions of Ukrainians have left Ukraine for obvious reasons. I know some have come back um, since, since the Russians were, were pushed back. But looking ahead um, to the post-war situation, uh, what, what can you anticipate doing in terms of reintegrating these millions of Ukrainians um, into society and stimulating the kinds of services that a democracy that's going to survive should be providing. Right, thank you for your question. And if I may, just uh, one small comment regarding the information war. So um, we have been united, we, we have united international companies and media companies to organize media campaigns to Russia uh, in order to show them what is really happening here in Ukraine. We were really hoping that people will go to streets and will start to protest. But as you see, this didn't happen. And this 20 years propaganda uh, achieved its goal. However, we, are, we continue to fight and we uh, continue to tell the truth 
service to all of the world and we see the support of the world that we are getting. So uh, this is this is some direction which the Ministry of Digital Transformation is also working on. So we are trying to spread um, as much information, as much truthful news as as we we can, and we see see the result of it uh, because we see the support of European countries and the United States of America, and we are really grateful and appreciate this support a lot. So, so thanks a lot for that. And answering your question, uh, so uh, it is nearly six million of Ukrainians who had to left um, the country. And uh, we understand that the majority of the, the majority of them are now in the countries of the European Union. Um, so um, what we have done already, we have launched um, the virtual DA business center, which is actually a multifunctional hotline where consultants give advice on how to register, how to find a job, how to run a business while staying in the European Union. So um, like the, the, the questions are very different, are very different starting on how to obtain the status of temporary protection or other legal grounds for staying in another country. Uh, the consultants also help Ukrainians on uh, how to figure out the questions about housing and deployment and how to uh, run the business in seven different countries, in Poland, in Bulgaria, in Czech Republic, Slovakia, Slovenia, Lithuania, and Germany. And this is not the full list. Uh, we are continuing working on other countries also. Uh, and also we have launched an offline center in Warsaw uh, on the 17th of May, uh, which um, helps also uh, to, to start a business in Poland. Uh, or to obtain the refugee status and uh, to uh, solve other um, other questions uh, which might be um, important for Ukrainians abroad. Well, this is clearly, a, I mean, a, a, a massive task. You've got an even more massive one under your nose. But just to stick to uh, the potential post-war reconstruction of, of Ukraine, Nadia, um, you know, this is sort of Marshall Plan level. We're seeing um, estimates of the damage to Ukraine in the hundreds of billions of euros already with, within 100 days of fighting. And the expectation is this is going to go on for quite some time. Um, this is going to necessitate a lot of money, not just from government to government, but from community to community. How do you envisage helping that? Well, again, going back to the concept of uh, communities helping other communities, uh, the local government project we had from 97 to 2007, USAID, actually one of our US uh, coordinators called it a Marshall Plan of the Mind because we were coming in and working with cities on economic development and like, and I, I see that as, as a model that can be replicated. But also, I think it's very important our, to create these uh, partnerships and connections to sustain uh, the interest. I mean, we're already hearing terms like compassion fatigue. So uh, we see our mission is to revive those kind of partnerships. Uh, Los Angeles, um, people have come to us. There's now an initiative called LA Stands with Ukraine. And there is being run by one of the biggest, I guess, PR companies whose clients are Disney and the LA football team uh, Chargers. Uh, and they wanna have a community-wide effort to uh, support Ukraine and collect things. And this is something that is, is, is not gonna be just a one-time thing. One of the things that has come up, uh, worked very closely with uh, KEF's Chamber of Commerce, the need for Ukrainians to get jobs. And so we've talked about, uh, and, and this actually came from the LA, maybe holding a virtual job fair uh, to hire uh, Ukrainians uh, virtually, right? So uh, there's just a lot of initiatives that can come when you have the whole community engaged in the process, as opposed to just one sector, you know, or, I mean, it all comes together, but I truly believe that the path uh, for the future to sustain the kind of assistance that is needed has to be uh, building these longer term relationships. I just would like to point out 
No international pledging uh, at the beginning of the war in 14, 15, 16 ever met the goals. Neither did the Chernobyl international pledging. So I see our mission to do whatever we can to make sure that we build a kind of uh, system and partnership so that the needs of the people of Ukraine are met not only just today, but tomorrow as well. Uh, that's, and I've got a, a couple of um, sort of final questions, but I'll, I'll just put one to you, Nadia, which is a very quickly one, just to elaborate on the compassion, Fatih. I mean, clearly the engagement of the rest of the world, particularly the West, has been, uh, you know, it's been electrified by what's going on there. Do you see signs that that's now waning? Well, listen, we have to be so grateful, and I don't think we yet appreciate the response of the world, uh, people responding to the crisis in Ukraine and uh, to support the people of Ukraine. But yes, uh, I, we're working with the March of Dimes and I was talking to them several weeks ago and they said that their donations are waning. Uh, you know, this is, look, I worked for FEMA. Uh, disasters, you know, they come, they come, they get a lot of press and then uh, the press goes away, the attention, yet the consequences have to be dealt with for years and years. So this is just a phenomenon that you, we have to uh, you know, be watchful and guard against and plan for. Okay, well, let, let me put that also to the mayor. Uh, and I guess this is really gonna be the final question because time is short. Um, but President Zelensky at Davos last weekend, he appealed for you know, enormous help to Ukrainian cities, um, but to Ukraine as a whole. Um, talked about the kind of damage that you've been seeing in cities like Kharkiv, not just to people uh, and to property, but also, of course, there's been a targeting of culture and of heritage, um, I guess a deliberate targeting by Russian forces. Um, how do you Im imagine rebuilding not just the physical side, but but um, the vibrancy of city life um, in Ukraine? Well, you have raised a very important question. When the Russian aggressors invaded our land, they purposefully destroyed our infrastructure. I can tell you that nearly 30% of our housing is now destroyed, which means that no less than 150,000 people have lost their homes. Out of the 200 schools in our city, 109 are ruined or damaged in some way, so they are not fit for teaching students at this time. Kindergartens have been ruined, as well as healthcare facilities. Not to mention the buildings of government offices, they were destroyed as well. This is a whole system of destruction that was fully intentional. Multiple substations were destroyed, those facilities that supply electricity, natural gas and water and central heat to the city. And so it is very important now to understand how we are going to rebuild it. I should also mention our cultural object. Our world famous Korolenko Library stores some unique books that belong to the cultural heritage of world significance. The enemy was trying to destroy it but we were able to rescue all those unique items at the price of tremendous effort and sacrifice. Even though we saved them this time, there is no guarantee that even worse attacks and destruction won't be attempted again. And our city has other museums that store unique exhibits of great value, such as paintings by Ivazovsky, Shevchenko, Repin. That is a cultural heritage of world significance too. And we made enormous efforts to save those valuable items from shelling. So when the war ends with our victory over the Russian occupiers, victory over Russia, we will have a lot of work to rebuild it all. And we will have to create totally new urban communities because many buildings have been ruined beyond repair.
And we are already working with our architects to develop a new vision of this city. We will depend on the world's support as we do this. Financial support will be needed. This is an extremely important matter for our city, for Ukraine, and for the international community as well. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you um, for, for that really fascinating uh, series of remarks. And Valeria's comment that modern war requires modern solutions, of course, also um, applies to modern reconstruction, uh, apply, um, requires modern solutions. And so these points are very, very well taken and very eloquently made. A real pleasure to, um, to host this panel, and I hope a lot of people watch it. Thank you so much um, for joining us. And um, back to Brian. Thanks, Ed. I think it really puts it into perspective to hear from people on the ground in Kharkiv about the damage inflicted to their city, the danger the people there are still in, as well as the inspiring leadership we've seen. And thank you to Valeria and Nadia for sharing the important work your organizations are doing. And as we heard, how critical it is for those efforts to find support and the resources that are needed to continue that vital work. For our next conversation, we're going to look even more closely at the human toll that the war has taken on millions of displaced Ukrainians. Rafaela Schweiger of the Robert Bosch Foundation is going to moderate a conversation with Kelly Clements, the Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees, Aloysius John, the Secretary General of Caritas Internationalis, Governor Sergei Khamily of the Khamelnytsky region of Ukraine, and David Koryani from the Budapest Mayor's Office. Over to you, Rafaela. Thanks, Brian. It's great to join the Pritzker Forum today. Since Russia's invasion in Ukraine in February, over 14 million people have left their homes. We see high numbers of people internally displaced and many others fleeing mainly to cities and neighboring countries and further afield. Humanitarian efforts are happening on all levels of government, government, governance with cities, local communities, civil society, and volunteer groups leading the refugee response with support from and alongside national governments and the international community. This panel today explores the largest humanitarian catastrophe in Europe since World War II. In our discussion with our distinguished panel, we will focus on the multilateral response to the refugee situation and the resources cities and local communities will need to continue their efforts to support refugees also in the medium and long term. And it's my pleasure and honor to um, have you, Governor, here um, with us today. And let me start with you and thank you for making the time for this conversation today. The Hermanitsky region plays a critical role in the humanitarian response as a hub for refugees as a corridor for those fleeing to the west parts of Ukraine and into neighboring countries, and as a central location receiving humanitarian aid coming into the country. So with nearly 350,000 refugees passing through and around 150 of them temporarily staying in your region, how are you addressing these influx of refugees and especially to accommodate their very varying needs from people being in transit in temporary stay but also long-term stay in your region good afternoon to all of you first of all i would like to start with words of gratitude and thank you for your continuous support of our country I cannot help recalling February 24th, when my country woke up from missile strikes over its territory. Missile strikes hit my region too, even though our region is rather remote and it has been, so to say, relatively quiet. At the same time, other peaceful cities in the east were heavily bombarded, and many people passed through our region as they took refuge from the war, and some of them stayed here. Over 400,000 displaced people passed through our territory and 155,000 relocated to our communities. Now that some of the invaded territories have been liberated, 8,000 people went back and we now have 147,000 registered displaced people in our region. We are trying to help them in every way 
In addition, many hospitals had to relocate here from eastern regions. Also, universities and colleges, the Dal University of Eastern Ukraine moved to our city of Kamyanets, Podilsky. The University of Internal Affairs, our leading school for criminal justice professionals, moved here from Kharkiv. Also, our region was the first and the only one to have created a mobile veterinary hospital. Because Russian strikes were indiscriminate and the fleeing people had many injured pets. For example, left without a paw after a shell explosion. And we did over a thousand surgeries for those wounded pets, which the fleeing people did not want to leave behind and would bring with them. There are 17,000 children among the displaced people who came to our communities. And on April 14, we resumed school classes for them. We were able to organize the placement of about 5,000 students in classes on site, while others have been studying online. There were instances when our online classes were attended by children from Luhansk in eastern Ukraine. Those children would attend our online classes while in Luhansk, together with those kids who are in our region now, owing to the Internet. We keep upholding our humanitarian front. Each one has to fulfill their task, no matter how often you are bombarded. It did not stop on uh, uh, February 24th, it never stopped. But in the meantime, we fully prepared our agricultural assets for the spring sowing campaign. This year, we did spring crop sowing on 880,000 hectares of farmland while last year it was on less than 757,000 hectares. So we realized that the country will need this increase in the crops area because those regions that are near the war zone will not be able to do as much. So I'm confident we will have enough food supplies this year. And also in providing assistance for the displaced people in our communities, as well as to other residents who are in need, it is very important for us to develop a systemic dialogue with various donor and volunteer organizations. So to that end, we have established a partnership exchange platform of international assistance under our regional administration. It is meant to serve as a tool of communication among all those who want to provide assistance to the Khmelnytsky region. This platform will show all the information about the needs on the ground and the resources offered by donors, everything put together on one platform. And I should mention that our regional administration has already worked for some time with external partners. In March, we signed a memorandum with a charitable organization named Protect Melnitsky Region. Our role is to help them coordinate and collect information about the needs on the ground. As we accurately know the people's needs, we can coordinate the delivery of assistance. Also notably, we were the first Ukrainian region to sign a memorandum of cooperation with a foreign partner that is not just a city, but a whole state, the state of Mississippi in the US. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Governor. And may I ask one very brief follow-up question in terms of the people that arrive in, in your district, in your region, what what is the what is the feeling of people do they want to stay or is it are you a hub for for going forward to other regions what is the sentiment right now um as uh, the war unfortunately is um is evolving um and is not in in near future that we're going to see an end Yes, you are right, but as you know, everybody dreams about returning home. No matter how much we try to provide the best possible conditions for those people and help them integrate, they are still attracted to their homeland 
and I'm sure they will get there. But today, many of them are here, and I keep saying to that all those who are in our region now are our citizens. We all are Ukrainians, and we gladly open for them not only our doors, but our hearts as well. Yesterday, I attended an event organized by our administration. We call this format Children for Children. That's when some celebrated actors and performers make a show specially for children of the displaced families and children of local residents. So those children have a good time together and develop some bonding. And I always tell them, years later you will see each other again even after those displaced kids have returned home. Your friendship will remain. We make such events all the time and we want our people to remember that regional identities do not divide us because we are a united nation in a united country. Thank you so much. And let me turn um, to you, Kelly. Um, the UNHCR has been working with national governments and local communities in, in Ukraine and across Europe. You and High Commissioner Grandi, along with other staff and colleagues, traveled to the region. You spoke with people. Um, can you share with us what have you learned about the challenges um, people are facing in this particular crisis? And also, what keeps you up at night when you look at the coming months um, in the light of people wishing to return home, in the light of the current situation, um, in the more medium uh, term strategic thinking of your organization? Thank you. Thanks, Rafaela. And it's really a pleasure to be on this panel and to, to follow the governor, um, because I think what I'll say is very complimentary to what he's, he's just mentioned uh, in his opening remarks. Uh, there are a few things. You gave some, some pretty big numbers at the very beginning, Rafaela. I mean, what we're talking about now um, in terms of displacement, displacement inside Ukraine, and the governor mentioned this, some of the people that are coming to his district have been displaced multiple times. We're looking at uh, over 8 million people inside the country that have moved from their homes, uh, some of them multiple times, as I mentioned. Then we have almost 7 million that have left Ukraine, um, and most, because of this desire, strong desire to return home, most have stayed close to Ukraine. Uh, they want to have the opportunity to connect with family, to check on property, to, to uh, take some care of elderly relatives that perhaps could not have moved from the country and so on. And we've seen a dynamic in this situation where I was in Moldova just, just a couple of weeks ago with the Secretary General and one of the very, very unusual um, very statistics is that 95% of the U Ukrainian uh, refugees have been housed with Moldovan families or have been housed pri privately. We are not talking about a situation where you have large apparatus that has been put into place in order to take care of those, uh, those immediate needs. These are being taken care of by the host countries um, in, and those where Ukrainians and others that have found themselves in those countries are staying. You know, the immediate needs, we're three months in. The immediate needs, I, I don't need to remind those that are, are watching, um, things have changed quite a bit from those early days where you saw the cars piled up, the, the lines of people trying to exit it quick, exit, exit quickly. Um, the, the, the evolution of the, the conflict of the war was, was quite uncertain. It's still somewhat uncertain, I would, I, would, uh, I would say. But things, you now, three months in, you have an approach that looks, how do we think about this in, in, in the medium to longer term? What Europe did and, and others have followed, including in Moldova, they made immediately available uh, a temporary protection where not only when people arrived in countries could they find a place to sleep, um, immediate provisions, perhaps they came with very little and those that have come out at this stage in the war, some have even greater needs than in the very early days of, 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 the, of the war. But also there was an opportunity in, in those countries to get temporary residence, uh, temporary protection. They could um, find opportunities in terms of employment, the labor market, put kids in school, although Ukraine has, as the governor said, it has a, a, a remarkable, a really strong digital education system. So this has made it possible for kids to continue to be educated uh, even outside of Ukraine in, in the months since the war started, which is incredibly important. Uh, and then health. 
you know, and the trauma, the psychosocial support, the, 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 the needs of people leaving the country um, are substantial and they will not be short term needs alone. They are our longer term needs, whether it's someone that has has withstood some kind of injury um, or longer term support that's required for a family. But most refugees want to go home and as quickly as possible. And the, the governor mentioned this very dynamic situation at the, at particularly in the border areas where you have returns, but not necessarily sustainable returns, short-term visits or kind of testing the water to see if a particular area and a neighborhood might be safe because people indeed want to get back um, make sure that their their homes, their properties, and and things are okay. You know, I've been um, in in five of those host countries in the last uh, the last weeks, um, and in each circumstance, it's been absolutely remarkable, both in terms of the immediate resilience of refugees to find both support for their immediate needs, but also thinking about the long term already from the the moment that they step foot. Uh, into uh, to another country, but also the the frontline support and the incredible generosity of host countries that have basically said, we know what's happening in your country. You are safe here. You we will provide. We will obviously with a lot of support. So for UNHCR, for the UN Refugee Agency, our role is to try to support those frontline responders, the local authorities, the mayors. Um, the, the central authorities in terms of what they might need. Uh, and and there, as we go along, as this becomes, unfortunately, and what keeps us up at night is the potential for a very protracted displacement situation um, that's obviously a, a, an unstable environment, the, the potential for far greater uh, movements of people inside the country to stay out of harm's way, to, to keep themselves safe. But then it's the long-term fragility of those neighboring countries and the social services that have been put at the disposal um, of refugees in these host communities that need sustained support from the international community, from us, from other multilateral institutions, other partners, uh, and we'll hear shortly from Caritas. But we can't, this is not a, a quick emergency. Even if the war ended tomorrow, we need to be there for the long term in terms of helping the, the rebuilding, the, the returns process, and so on in terms of support. Thank you, Kelly. And may I ask one follow-up question? Um, because you mentioned the temporary protection in, in, the European, uh, in the European Union. Would you say what we have in terms of legal frameworks in place, um, is that adequate? And is it about implementing funding collaboration, or do we need more frameworks also on the European level? Well, this is the first time this tool has been used and hallelujah, <laughs> it's great to have this tool because it is, apps, it is directly related to what uh, is part of the Global Compact on Refugees. The idea was not to have parallel support systems. Here, we're gonna support refugees and leave out the host communities. The idea was inclusion so that you're supporting refugees and you're supporting the hosts and you're allowing refugees to become as self-reliant as quickly as possible And this temporary protection helps them do that. Giving back economically and, and all, in all kinds of other ways as opposed to just being beneficiaries of an aid program. So in terms of the, the tools, we have it. There is a difference from country to country how quickly uh, refugees have availed themselves of that particular mechanism. And you know, in, in the early days, that there was a, a reluctance to immediately step forward because one, refugees didn't know how long they were going to be there. Um, and two, they weren't sure where they wanted to settle temporarily for in the medium to longer term. We're starting to see this settle out a bit. Again, most are staying in the immediate vicinity, um, but there is in, in, in some places, it's a little bit slower in terms of the uptake of the registration of temporary protection. So we work a lot with, you know, with the, what, what rights do refugees have when they come into those countries? What services can they avail themselves of and so on? But this really puts it together in a way that we have not seen in other contexts and hopefully can be repeated, including for other refugees in other parts of the world. Well, thanks so much, Kelly, and I want to turn it to um, Aloysius here, um, who represents Caritas, which is one of the largest NGOs, both in Ukraine, um, but almost all the other um, receiving neighboring countries, including Poland, Moldova, Hungary, 
Romania, to just name a few. So you have a very unique perspective on the situation um, in the regions. And for example, your Tents of Hope have been set up at border crossings. Local chapters are actively providing uh, humanitarian assistance to millions of people. And you have called also, which I think is crucial for the opening of humanitarian um, corridors um, in the very near future. So what are the on the ground realities Caritas has witnessed, especially at international borders? I'm also referring to what Kelly just um, described and what has been the experience of your staff and volunteers when coordinating with local governments um, in the region? Thank you, Rafaela, and uh, thanks for in inviting us for this, uh, for this conference. Uh, Caritas International is, is a confederation of 162 member organizations present in 200 countries. And as such, we have a grassroots present, which is before an event, during the event, and after the event. As part of the church, we are present there as a local uh, organization. Um, from the very beginning itself, Caritas has been in communion with 1.5, more than 1.5 million people who have been made victim uh, overnight, and it has been helping them on, from the area, from the field of food and uh, food and shelter, health, and other kinds of activities. And one of the major challenges I think uh, we have, and it has been told by Kelly, is the psychosocial problems, because today children are, with, are without education for past three months, but even before that, there was COVID-19, which is already uh, creating some problems. We need to have this in mind. That is one key challenge. The other challenge will be the women uh, who have been traumatized, and this is experienced by our, our member organizations which are present there, because we have a presence in Ukraine. There are two caritas in Ukraine with 60 centers where they, help, where, where they receive people, and around in the six countries, Poland, Romania, Moldova, Hungary, Slo uh, Slovakia, and Czech Republic, we have different centers which are, which, where we are working. And there we are working with volunteers. So the biggest challenge the volunteers are, uh, are facing today is the accompaniment of these people, especially those who are having psychosocial traumatism. The other, uh, the other uh, problem which is also very often surfaced is people want to go back, as it was told by Kelly earlier, they want to go back. And I think this is something between brackets. But the problem is, this is a protracted crisis, but which doesn't, which cannot be named that way. People think that the, the war will be over, they will go back and they'll start, start again. But I don't know whether they realize that the whole city is uh, are destroyed. And today we have to see how we could ensure their progressive, uh, the progress, progressive recovery process. So the question today we are reflecting now is how could we think of for example, having small uh, small uh, uh, villages uh, for them so that they are able to come together, live together and plan together when, so that when they go back, they're able to get back to normal life quickly. That's one challenge which, the, which is under, under reflection. So that means we're talking about today itself, we're talking about the midterm and long-term recovery uh, in, in different areas. One area will be the shelters and then how to help them to construct their homes. The other one is the psychosocial uh, aspect where children and women need to be taken into consideration. How do we prepare them now for a better future there? And this is going to be a very long-term process as Kelly has said earlier. And then the education of the children because they want their children to go back to school but today they are not in a situation to do that. So how do we get them to prepare them to go back to school? And, and uh, maybe another point which also we need to keep in mind is uh, the protection of uh, minors and, and women who are also today in highly vulnerable situation. Our people uh, in, in Poland already uh, have noticed a certain number of uh, very illegal practices there to take people away, to lure them to other places. Uh, so these are some of the some of the challenges which we need to address, which we are reflecting now. So Caritas is present in uh, in the different six different countries uh, around uh, around uh, uh, around uh, Ukraine, and there is a very strong collaboration between Caritas Ukraine and also the different Caritas. And I should also underline the good collaboration that is existing between the different local governments and also the government in, uh, in Ukraine, uh, cities in Ukraine, uh, along with Caritas Ukraine. 
And I also take this opportunity to thank UNHCR for the good collaboration which we are having with UNHCR in responding to the needs of the people. And this is something where I think today we need to come together as, as, as an international community. Thank you, Eliza, and, and I think indeed that that is the key, not only having the, the money flowing and the people working on it, but the collaboration between all the different actors um, on all different levels. And um, one um, municipal actor that we have here um, in our virtual room is um, David Kurani from um, uh, the city of Budapest. Um, and Budapest has seen over half a million refugees having moved or passed through Hungary and Budapest has been leading um, on the humanitarian response. So David, I would like to hear from you also how Budapest city infrastructure has been able to accommodate this high number um, of people and how you're dealing with that also in the medium to long term. Thank you, Rafael, and, and a heartfelt thanks to the Pritzker Forum organizers. It's a great honor and, and a pleasure to join this uh, illustrious panel. And uh, I would like to convey the warm greetings of uh, Mayor Koracsony, who unfortunately couldn't uh, join us today. Uh, indeed, since the war began in Ukraine, um, now it's close to 700,000 people from Ukraine who crossed directly. And then if you count arrivals to third countries, that number is well above a million by now. Uh, while many move on to other European countries, uh, as of today, there are somewhere between a, about 100,000 to 140,000 Ukrainian refugees that are still in Hungary. Most of them are in Budapest. And those numbers may actually strike you as, as low, and, and indeed they are if you compare it to, to Poland or the Czech Republic. Warsaw alone hosts about 300,000 refugees. The Czech Republic granted close to 400,000 emergency visas, while in Hungary only 22,000 people applied for uh, asylum so far. And the reason for that, unfortunately, that there is a widespread perception among Ukrainians that uh, Hungary is not exactly a, a friendly country. And that's thanks to our dear leader, Viktor Orban, the prime minister, who has been uh, quite cozy with Vladimir Putin and quite antagonistic towards President Zelensky and, and Ukraine. Uh, and all the more so because we have a national government that in contrast uh, to the Syrian refugee crisis, at least in rhetoric, uh, is welcoming towards refugees from Ukraine. But in practice, most of the actual assistance is provided by municipalities, by NGOs, by international organizations, and indeed, as, as the Deputy High Commissioner Kelly mentioned, by the people themselves, actually. So that effort uh, is spearheaded by, by Budapest. Uh, as I mentioned, most of the refugees are concentrated there. We provide assistance in, in three broad categories, one short-term accommodation to long-term accommodation, that's in scarce supply. Uh, we provide three meals a day for those who, who need it. We offered, uh, and many take good use of that, free use of the local public transportation. And we provide both virtual and physical uh, information services in Ukrainian and Russian for, uh, for those who, who need it. Soon, we are planning to establish what we call a refugee center at, at City Hall itself, in, in physically located in the building, that would offer more comprehensive services, including legal and psychological advice and assistance uh, to access to education. About 40% of the refugees in, in Hungary are school-aged children, as Kelly uh, already talked about the issue. Our problem, frankly, is that while we would want to offer those services in the long run, the problem is that the city really does not control much in terms of those infrastructures. So we have no schools, we have no hospitals, that's all controlled by the state. That's again in contrast with, uh, for example, Prague or, or Warsaw that still is in control of uh, their hospitals and, and schools. And we, we, of course, do everything in collaboration with uh, district municipalities, NGOs, aid organizations. We are in very close contact with UNHCR. Uh, we established a joint task force uh, with UNHCR. We coordinate with UNICEF, with IOM, with WHO, Doctors Without Borders, their own uh, Caritas and, and Migration Aid. And of course, many local civil society and, and church, church groups as, as well. Where we really struggle, uh, essentially two fronts. One is building capacity, as I mentioned, in terms of capacity, we are in short supply. Both infrastructural capacity, especially when it comes to long-term accommodation, we are looking into already uh, if and when, of course, the crisis persists uh, going into the winter, we are very 
low on long-term accommodation options. So we are looking into options with regard to museums and theaters and institutions that are under municipal control. Uh, and of course, building human capacity as well, social workers mainly, but in some other categories as well. And then last but not least, money. Uh, the city is in a, in a dire financial situation. Already before the Ukraine war erupted, we lost about 40% of our operational budget. That's mainly due to loss of tax revenues due to COVID, but also because of the financial squeeze of the national government uh, punishing a, an opposition-led city in, in, in the country. So that's an issue that we urgently need to address, and that's where city diplomacy comes in that I'm happy to address uh, later on. Thanks so much, David. Because we have um, not so much time for the discussion, but I would very briefly turn to you on the role of city diplomacy, because I think it's, it's crucial how you work with other cities um, in order to collaborate. How, how does that work? Who, who are you working with on the international level? So very briefly, uh, we established back in 2019 something called the Pact of Free Cities. That's originally a collaboration between the Visegrad four capitals, Bratislava, Budapest, Prague, and, and Warsaw. And because there was so much interest, we expanded that network. Now we have about 30 cities from LA to London, to Paris, to Athens, to Taipei. Then we have many members globally, and we're about to expand further. And as the war started, um, the Pact has mobilized almost immediately, we started sharing best practices, especially in the Visegrad Four Circle, because those are all frontline um, capital cities. And we started uh, a, a dialogue with the European Commission and reached out to the European Commission. And we are in this process now trying to convince the European Union to build a relationship that is much more direct with these cities, these cities that are on the front lines and, and, and as Kelly again mentioned it's critically important so that we have access to the resources, including from EU funds. So that's what we have been very actively doing through the pact and mobilizing the lobbying power of the pact in Brussels. Thanks so much, David. And um, it's it's crucial to hear that, but there's also so much more work to do when it comes to city diplomacy um, on this situation, but also more broadly globally. And there are so many actors um, working on this. Um, I will come to our concluding panel and I would like to hear from everyone um, here on your key asks going forward and the commitments based on what we've heard um, in this discussion um, when it comes to support to local governments in the humanitarian but also the more long-term response on all the different levels um, that we discussed today and I would first like to turn it to the governor um, to hear from you your asks what do you need going forward as um, a region um, to address the situation? Uh, Our first and foremost need concerns the children. We always emphasize that. I mentioned that we have 17,000 children among the displaced people, and when they were fleeing from the war, not everyone had an opportunity to bring a notebook or a tablet, and they need those devices for online schooling. And to remind you that 17,000 displaced children, besides that, we are in need of thermos containers to deliver hot meals to those who need them. What I mean is big, multi-gallon catering standard thermos containers for hot food. Another pressing need at this time is surveillance cameras for public safety. We need as many of them as possible because there are some individuals that were recruited by Russia to do some bad things and then send information to the enemy. While we do have the public safety video cameras program in place, we would like to scale out this program for the whole region and increase the number of safety cameras 20 or 30 times for the whole region. One other priority item is MRI equipment, it's a magnetic resonance imaging system for the regional hospital. Those are some of the priority needs at this time. The list of priority needs may be changing, but we will always have them. That is why we came up with the idea of that platform, a central information exchange where you can log in, click the button for a specific community, and you will see what specific needs they have for their schools and for everything. 
and charity donors can go there and see this as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Governor, for for um, this and and indeed it's it's a broad array of, of actual day to day needs that, that that we see in your region. David, let me turn to you again um, on the on the political level. Your key ask as a municipality um, responding to the situation, but also active in your international networks. Um, what do you need going forward? You need access to European funds. You need access to the emergency funds, direct access that is not through the national government. And that's not just Budapest, but Warsaw is in a, an equally difficult position from a domestic political perspective. So that's that's uh, that's the critical piece. On the long term, uh, another piece, if I wanted to mention that we already started discussions about in the pact or within the pact is uh, to what extent and how exactly the pact members, these cities could lend support, know-how, expertise uh, for the reconstruction of Ukraine and Ukrainian cities. And that's also something that we initiated a dialogue on with the European Commission. And that's that's something that we are very keen on. So point well taken on the access to financing um, on the European level, but potentially also beyond. Um, Aloysius, let me turn it um, to you. You might have asked, but you're so big, you can also make commitments to those actors um, working locally on how you work together and how you collaborate. Um, in terms of ask, maybe I have three asks. The first one, I think, is to stop the war. Because we need to stop this war, we need to find a political solution before we think of many things, because if the war continues, people will suffer. So that's the first ask. How can the international communities, how can the cities come together and find all the means to find a solution to this war is the first ask. The second one is the construction. Because today, this is a very peculiar protracted crisis. And which is and wherein people want to go back to their homes because they have been living normally. So the, the challenge we have as humanitarian and international community is how do we strategize the construction of houses, which cannot take place overnight. So what could be the intermediary steps and how the surrounding countries could be a vector where then wherein they could people could be kept there, they could stay there as a first step and then go back to the countries where the constructions are taking place. That's the second, uh, that's the second ask and for which money will be needed. And we need enormous amount of money for that. And how do we get this? How do we mobilize these funds is the second one. The third one is the psychosocial support to the children, as it was said by the governor and also to women, because many women could be also today uh, uh, widows overnight without uh, in three months time, the whole life has been shattered. How are we going to help them? That I think is something which we need to have this between brackets, a uh, gender-based approach to this problem, wherein women are taken care of with their children, perhaps, if they have children. So these are the three asks for me, but the most important one is this war has to stop. If not, uh, we can discuss here, but if nothing will happen. Thank you. Thank you, Lois. And even we, we heard from Kelly before, even if it stopped tomorrow, we all wish and hope and work for it it's still a lot of work that will go on for months and years in terms of rebuilding, investing in, in education and housing, et cetera. Um, so it's very crucial um, to, to have that uh, conversation and continue that conversation. Kelly, lastly, let me turn to you. Your ask, but also commitments as <laughs> your. Yeah, I noticed the, the, the uh, Alocius is, uh, was all asks, but commitments, uh, Caritas is huge. So they're a very important partner, I think, uh, on, uh, on the ground in both Ukraine and, and the neighboring countries as well. No, um, a couple of things in terms of the, the final reflections here. I mean, what, what, what David mentioned in terms of the power of a network and how you use this particular moment um, on a global stage, as well as within the region, we do have that moment. I mentioned the Global Compact on Refugees. The last Global Refugee Forum was in 2019. Cities played an incredibly important role um, as that frontline responder in many contexts. And we have, of course, uh, an example in this particular situation that, that even surpasses some of our conversations I think we had in 2019. Some of the things that were mentioned in terms of the ways that we can support, some of the commitments we can make. First, you know, cities have the solutions in addition to needing the resources in, in terms of response. So the direct consultations that we need to be having as an overall community with local authorities, with the service providers, 
you know, with the, the health, education, labor, markets and the like in terms of the, the, the responsibility that they feel as the first line response, res, responders, but also the pressures that come with it. I was in Prague not too long ago and I heard from the mayor of Prague just how acute some of those pressures are. So that longer term support to community services uh, in terms of being able to be good hosts and obviously refugees being at the center of those discussions. The fact that we need to have, and this comes again to another commitment, how can we help uh, governments, local authorities, be able to distinguish between those that may have availed themselves from this temporary protection um, and then and may be captured in the system and those who may be falling through the cracks. And this gets a little bit to the Caritas comment in terms of the, the needs, the requirements, some who may not know where to go in terms of that support. And I think that, that, da that data point becomes very important, especially planning for a medium to a long-term response. Um, all of the panelists have talked about funding. Um, I mentioned sustainable funding. Uh, funding from EU sources, of course, but the international community. Even as the, the war goes on, we can't take the spotlight off of the requirements that will continue humanitarian, but in the long term. So sustained support, absolutely fundamental. And again, can we use the 2023 Global Refugee Forum again to help, we hope, rebuilding Ukraine uh, at that stage. But if the, the situation becomes very protracted, continued support will be key. Um, and then, you know, finally, it's a it's a beyond Ukraine conversation, uh, Rafaela. We have some really incredible examples now, both of response but long-term support on the protection side. Can we use some of the models of what's happening now with this response for the hundred million forcibly displaced around the world, including including uh, those uh, from Ukraine? You know, there are important protection tools, but also ways of collaboration, partnership the ways that these various stakeholders, most importantly, uh, frontline supporters are responding. That's something we should be doing all over the world, uh, including in this region. Thanks. Kelly, thank you so much. And thanks to um, all, all panelists for um, the, the insights, but also the incredibly important um, work that you're doing on all levels of, of governance. And I think we heard so many points on where to act now concretely, on funding, um, but also the political processes like the Global Refugee Forum ahead. And I'm sure that local authorities will come in quite strong um, as they just did at the International Migration Review Forum globally um, to raise their voice, to raise their needs and also to demand access to, to financing. And um, I wanna especially thank the governor um, in this difficult situation, making the time for the discussion and, and joining us. So thank you everyone, back to you, Brian. Thank you, Rafaela, and to the entire panel for that powerful discussion on the immediate needs and long-term challenges of the refugee crisis, which has been created by this protracted war. In particular, the ultimate ask we heard was to stop the war first and foremost. And then there is the dose of reality that even if the war ends tomorrow, the work that needs to be done is going to last for years. Now, these conversations about the role of cities in responding to the crisis of war also remind us of the critical role that cities play. Cities are on the forefront of so many global challenges, which is why the Chicago Council on Global Affairs is excited to announce the newly established Pattis Family Foundation Global Cities Book Award. This $25,000 award celebrates books that generate ideas and deepen our understanding of global cities and urban policy. Submissions are open now through December 31st, and the first winner will be announced at the June 2023 Pritzker Forum on Global Cities. To learn more about the award, please go to thechicagocouncil.org slash book award. Today, we have been joined by mayors, humanitarians, and policymakers to explore the critical role that cities are playing in the response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. This completely senseless and unnecessary war is destroying the lives of millions of Ukrainians, inflicting massive infrastructure damage, and costing a devastating human toll. But cities, and especially local leaders, have been critical in the response to the Russian invasion. And they're also going to be integral to the recovery and rebuilding of once vibrant Ukrainian cities. Cities that have been the site of horrible atrocities, the type of which many thought 
had been relegated to the confines of European history, and yet have now been replayed in Bucha, Mariupol, and Kharkiv, as well as across Ukraine. Juxtaposed against the scenes of human suffering and devastation, we've also seen images from Ukraine and abroad of people opening their hearts and homes to refugees, providing transportation, food, and support to the people of Ukraine in a time of need. Mayors and city networks have come together to unlock resources and mobilize solidarity, calling on their national governments to provide aid and help defend a country under attack. There is no justification for this war. But where we can, we can take the stories of resilience, the vignettes of innovation and survival, and the strength of human spirit, and we can envision a way forward. I want to thank all of today's speakers, and I also want to thank each and every one of you, our viewers, who have joined us for these critical conversations that highlight just how important local action is in the face of war. To learn more about the war in Ukraine, please visit thechicagocouncil.org slash Ukraine. And be sure to sign up for our monthly newsletter to receive regular updates. I hope you stay safe, and I hope to see you again soon.